All right, uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, thank you to everyone that has registered to attend. Uh, you are viewing the Discover Baseball uh, in Minnesota series that we started. This is our second presentation, uh, Town Ball Parks of Minnesota by author Todd Mueller. Uh, just some housekeeping uh, things to go over here as we get started. We do ask that you keep your microphone muted at all times just to cut down on the feedback from outside noise while Todd's presenting. Um, you are uh, welcome to have your uh, camera on if you want. Uh, feel free to turn that on. We are recording the presentation, so there is a chance you might uh, get entered into that screen once it's recorded. Um, on the bottom of your screens, because we have the microphones muted, there is a chat box. You are welcome to enter any questions you have in there. We'll be monitoring those throughout the presentation. Um, we'll try to save most of the questions until the end. If there is a clarifying issue that needs to be addressed right away, again, feel free to throw it in there. And as we monitor it, I, you know, I can jump in and um, interrupt Todd for a second to get uh, whatever the issue is taken care of. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so my name is Matt Carter. I'm executive director of the Dakota County Historical Society. And our organization was founded in 1939. So if you're not familiar with us, um, this picture here is Fred Washi, who was the organizational founder of the Historical Society uh, many years ago. Our main Washi Museum is the headquarters of the organization. Uh, this is where we house our artifact collection, our research library, and uh, many of our staff offices are there. We also operate the Leduc Estate in uh, Hastings, and it, I'll go back. If I didn't mention it, this is in South St. Paul, um, Minnesota here. Um, the Leduc Estate is in Hastings. Uh, in 2005, we entered into a partnership agreement to operate this 1866 Gothic Revival Mansion. Um, it has 15 different rooms and 10 different fireplaces throughout. And uh, if you haven't seen it, we definitely encourage you to, to take a look at it, uh, especially during the summer um, as our tour season opens. Our third site that we operate is the Sibley Historic Sites. Uh, this is across the river um, from Fort Snelling. Um, this is in Mendota, Minnesota. We operate this in partnership with the Minnesota Historical Society. And with these three sites, again, we are a nonprofit membership organization. And uh, we do want to thank those of you that provided a donation towards this event. Um, if you're interested in donating, we will send a follow up uh, link at the end of this with a, a link to click on to donate. Um, at the end of this, again, it, since it is being recorded, um, Within the next day or so, we will send a follow-up email to everyone that um, participated in this, and it will have a survey. So we just ask that you take a couple of minutes. It's a, 10 questions, literally will take two to three minutes on average. So uh, tell us how, how we're doing, what you thought of the presentation. And uh, from there, we'll also include a link to that YouTube video. So with that, I will turn it over to Todd and he can begin our presentation. Thanks, Matt. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Mueller. I'm the author of a book called Town Ball Parks of Minnesota. And I want to share with you tonight um, some of the stories, some of the ballparks, and some of the cities and towns that I was able to visit along the way. Usually, if I do a presentation live, I ask for a show of hands as to how many have attended a town ball game. And typically, uh, about 60% of the audience has been to a town ball game and the other 40 have not. Have not. Uh, I'm going to assume the percentages are about the same tonight. So for those of you who know all about town ball, this will be a trip down memory roll. For those that don't know anything about town ball, I think you're going to be incredibly impressed by the quality of the baseball parks in this state, second to none in the country. Um, it's really fitting that the Dakota County Historical Society is sponsoring this because Dakota County plays a very important role in baseball in Minnesota. In fact, in 1857, one year before statehood, uh, the first game of baseball was played on a park in the ghost town of Nininger. Nininger is just north uh, along the Mississippi River from Hastings. There's still a Nininger Township. You can go there and you can actually see a historic uh, 
uh, landmark monument that talks about the city of uh, Nininger. John Nininger uh, was hoping that it would become the state capital. It didn't quite work out that way, but his boys, the top nine players on, in the city, played another team in August of 1857. Very first baseball game in Minnesota. Um, let's go forward 37 years from that date. Now we're at September 1st, 1894. Uh, the place is Hinkley and the time is 11 o'clock. Uh, the state's greatest disaster is literally just two hours away. Two small fires combine to build a firestorm so large that it could be seen 200 miles away. It was one of the driest summers. Two inches of rain fell over three months and one out of every three days was in the 90s. This fire was fueled by a quarter century of tree debris left by loggers and it literally exploded over the city of Hankley. Uh, as people scrambled to get on two trains that were basically ready to back up out of uh, Hinkley, eight six-year-old James Michael Brennan and his sisters Nellie and Mary were whisked up and put in the front of the train. They were devastated, hysterical, crying because they thought they had lost their family, uh, seven other members of their family, only to find out hours and hours later when the soot-covered train uh, arrived back in Duluth that mom and dad and the other siblings were alive and actually were on the same train, just on the back of it. So what to do? Uh, the fire killed 400 people, probably injured another 800. But the Brennans, like a lot of people, decided Hinkley was their home and they came back and homesteaded. Uh, and I'm sure that baseball back then was a good way to get the mind of the players and the families off of the hor horrific uh, tragedy that just happened. So James Michael became a heck of a ball player. He was a shortstop and uh, he was, he played for the team um, called the uh, Red Sox or the, actually the White Sox for Hinkley. And he became a regional commissioner. He wanted to uh, expand this game across the state. So he met with two members of the St. Paul Pioneer Press and a member of the St. Paul Superintendent's Park Superintendent, and they founded the Minnesota Baseball Association uh, back in 1924. In fact, their first uh, tournament was at Lexington Park in 1924. So really, as it turns out, Hinkley is the home of amateur baseball going back 96 years. And there is still a beautiful, beautiful ballpark at Hinkley. Man, if you wouldn't mind switching the uh, graphic here. This is the book I got the information from on the Hinkley Fire Under a Flaming Sky. It's a great read and I strongly suggest you read it. Um, it gives you a fascinating detail as this horrific tragedy. Uh, the next slide will show the Hinkley Ballpark today. And it's absolutely gorgeous. As you can see, the pines are lit up at night. It's uh, just a beautiful ballpark. So Hinkley is the birth town of amateur baseball as we know it. And that makes baseball Minnesota's most storied sport. Um, next slide, please. This is the cover of the book. And by the way, that's Johnson Park in New Ulm at the upper, upper uh, third of the photo. Um, so facts about Minnesota baseball. First of all, there are more teams in Minnesota that play amateur baseball than any state in the union. Now this blew me away. You think of Texas, Florida, New York, California. Nobody beats Minnesota as far as number of teams that are organized under one roof. Um, typically there are about 300 teams per year all the way from Roseau down to Caledonia and Winona. And there's 5,000 active players. And while those numbers are fairly impressive, back in the 1950s, there were over 800 teams before people learned of air conditioning and the Minnesota Twins. Um, there's a board that handles everything about these active players. It's a single board that has jurisdiction over all rules and regulations of the game. 
including GPS qualification of each player, and it's based on a 30 mile radius from that particular ballpark. Uh, they also hold a state tourney held annually over Labor Day uh, that sees up to 15,000 people. And this coming year, 2021, it'll be in Waconia, Hamburg, and I believe Chaska, three outstanding ballparks. So let's talk about how the group is divided. The teams are divided into three groups. There's class A. These are teams that are normally within the 694, 494 belt. Um, there's class B, that's 48 teams, and they tend to be bigger towns, but there are exceptions. Meesville is one of them. Meesville has a population of 125 and Dundas 1300. And then there are 219 C teams. So that's the breakdown of the different divisions. And then the question I'm asked most often is why? Why did I write this book? Well, first of all, I just love baseball. I love the Twins. My mom made me a Minnesota Twins uniform back in 1961. And I had my proudly showed my number seven on the back, which was outfielder Lenny Green, center fielder, who by the way, just passed away about two years ago. I also love traveling through small towns. And whenever I go through a small town, I would look for those oil derrick structure lights. And typically if I saw those, there was one heck of a ballpark at the bottom. And that would include fields like Shakopee, the old field that was down in the swamp area, Chaska, uh, Jordan, and a beautiful ballpark up in Cold Spring. So how did I come up with the featured ballparks? I sent out emails probably to 50 different managers asking them for the most unique ballparks in their area. They gave me a list of maybe 30 or 40 ballparks, and I actually ended up going to over 125 ballparks from as far north as Detroit Lakes, as far south as Wyndham. And uh, I came up with 27, I wanted 25, I ended up with 27. I'm a social science major from college, not an accountant. Missed it by two points. Um, and they range in quality and size from a 4.4 million facility in Minnetonka to a field at the end of a dirt road in Red Eye Township, Minnesota, to a team that no longer exists because of the lack of players. Uh, it's a 230 page coffee table book. There were 500 photos inside the book selected from over 20,000 images shot by five photographers and we shot it over the summer of 2016. I'd like to share with you some of the ballparks and the players who have either have or continue to play ball in these iconic ball fields. Let's start with Bird Island. Bird Island is due west of the Twin Cities about two hours on Highway 212. And if you were going to read one story about how the renovation of a ballpark could impact the community, this would be it. It is truly, in my opinion, the greatest transformation of a field in amateur baseball history in the state of Minnesota. Uh, back in 1990, an optometrist came to town named Mike Nagel, and he was appalled at what he saw. It was a baseball field that was shared by the football team. The end zone uh, goalposts were in the right field, right in the middle of right field, and the ball was live and in play. If it hit the post, you still chased after it. It was a mess. He decided to get a new ballpark, worked hard with the team, worked hard with the mayor, worked hard with the council people, worked hard with the Lions Club. And these, this group came together and decided that they were going to build a, um, a brand new ballpark. Um, it is an amazing ballpark. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it was so good that they were actually allowed and won the opportunity to host the state tournament there about four or five years ago. They spent $500,000 on the ballpark. They got a million dollars in in-kind financing and assistance from donations. Even the ladies in the flower club uh, donated their time to spruce up the ballpark. In fact, the mayor once said, if the town had been any bigger, I just don't think it would have come together like it did. 
So that's Bird Island. Let's, uh, Matt, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and switch it. That's Bird Island on a beautiful night, an incredible uh, sunset. And you can see to the right, uh, there's a group that sit on a patio right above the dugout and it's a great layout and a beautiful park. In fact, Mike Nagel goes out there in the morning and just stands and looks and says it's his most beautiful place on earth. Next slide, please. This is Fairfax. And this is a guy by the name of Shavy Prax. Shavy Prax has been taking care of the Fairfax ballpark for decades. And Shavy does things his way, and that's the only way. And when everybody else is gone, you'll see a single person out there working the mound, working the batting area, working the baselines. And he's an amazing character. A great player came out of Fairfax, a gentleman by the name of Dana Kicker. Some of you may remember the name. He was called up to the show during the 1990 season. He was the number four in the pitching rotation for the Boston Red Sox and started in game two of the American League Championship Series. He went five and two thirds inning before he being pulled to a standing ovation of blue collar Bostonians who were like that farm kid from Minnesota. And he shares his story in here, including his pickup baseball team with his buddies in Dandelion Park. Next slide, please. This is Dassel, Minnesota. And this is the character corner here. The, this area is kind of reserved for ex players and players who like to consume quantities of beer and give the visiting left fielder nothing but grief during the entire game. It's hysterical. Dassel is a beautiful ball, ballpark set in a, a real pristine setting. And it's absolutely one of my favorite ballparks. And it's, it's such a great ballpark. It has uh, hosted many state tournaments. The other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put this up. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it or not. This is called Magic in the Grass. And as you can see, there's a diagram here. You can see a pattern. And if you've ever wondered, like I have, how they make those patterns in the grass, it's quite simple. They set up a pattern with string and, and uh, stakes, usually radiating out from home plate. And then they cut the grass on one piece of the uh, design coming toward home plate and the next one right next to it going back out to the outfielder. And this back and forth motion bends the grass in different angles, giving it the look. That particular rising sun is what they call it, takes uh, caregiver uh, Cole Flick about five to five and a half hours of uh, time to construct. And then it's uh, updated throughout the course of the uh, course of the year. So that's Dazzle. Can we have the next slide, please? Tucked next to Northfield is the small town of Dundas, the Dundas Dukes. They've been to many state tournaments. They have a fantastic ballpark. And they also have a very famous pitcher that still is pitching for them. If you're a St. Paul Saint fan, you might recognize the name of Charlie Rudd. Charlie owns the most Saints wins, the most innings pitched as a Saint, the most strikeouts, and the most complete games, all from a guy who looks like a cross-country runner, 5'10", 160 pounds. And to add to all that, in 2009, he was ordained a Lutheran minister. Granite Falls, next slide, please. Granite Falls is one of those ballparks that is tucked so perfectly between the hills on one side and the Minnesota River on the other. In fact, you're right. If you look at that left field fall pole, you can just see it in the photograph. That's 305 feet from home plate. So you say hit something 320, 330, you're going to clear the levee and you're going to plunk it right into the Minnesota River. And that's really cool. And as pretty as this picture is, you should see it at night. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, 
it had an old time grumpy old caretaker named Bud Blint and Bud would work out there in his seventies and probably into his eighties. And he'd be picking weeds and doing stuff out on the warning track. And people would come up to him and say, why are you doing that? Nobody can see it. And his response was the outfielder can, and that's good enough for me. And that's the type of pride that these caregivers uh, give to their ballparks. And they're competitive. They're competitive as heck. They want to make sure they have the best ballpark they can have. Next slide, please. This is an area view, area view uh, courtesy of the Chaska Fire Department in ladder number two of uh, Chaska Ballpark down in the flats of the Minnesota River Valley. Chaska is an amazing ballpark and probably one of the most famous ballparks, top five in the state. They do a lot of tournaments here. Um, they have a great fan base. Uh, it's just a beautiful ballpark. They also have a gentleman by the name of Dale Welter. And Dale was the uh, groundskeeper for a lot of years. And his son, who played baseball for the Chaska Cubs, said in the 80s when he was just a teenager, he thought all dads got up in the middle of the night to water their lawn. Well, it turns out Dale would get up in the middle of the night before a big game and before irrigation and get the hose out and start watering the grass down. Uh, sometimes there'd be a little bit of a shock when he'd get there in the dark. He'd flip the lights out, and one time there was a gasp, and a couple came running out of the uh, home dugout. They also have a banner as you come out to the field, and it reads, Pride, Respect, and Passion. This is hallowed ground. And that's the way the best coaches look at their team and look at their ballpark. Minnetonka. Minnetonka is a Kermanum, easy for me to say. Uh, I look at it as a curmudgeon that loves baseball in its purest form, which is sand and grass. And I look at Minnetonka and go, uh, I just don't like it. It's all artificial turf. Uh, even the mound is spray painted brown. The base paths are spray painted brown. It looks like dirt when you're 50 feet away, 75 feet away on the sands, but it's not. But you know, it makes sense because they can do 430 baseball and football events on that field each year. Um, and I can tell you early spring when it's high school play starting baseball time that this field is by far the most requested field in the entire state. Um, 10 years ago, 45 kids, 16 to 18 were playing ball. Today they can offer the fields to 180 kids because they, they have the time and the space to play ball. They can take up to nine inches of rain and be ready to play in just 30 minutes. So it makes sense to do what they did. It's probably a model for other cities to emulate and I'm sure they will because they've been very very successful and they're very happy with it. Next slide shows the field. This is it right here. Uh, when I told people that I was going to do this book, uh, five out of ten would lean into me and say, listen, you got to get down to this little town south of Hastings. It's called Meeseville and the team is called the Mud Hens. Well, they weren't telling me anything new. As a matter of fact, Meesville's to amateur baseball in Minnesota, what the Guthrie is to acting, it is ground zero. It's a fantastic setting. It's a fantastic ballpark. And to add to it, they have great teams. They're class B, even though they're 125 population. Um, they can seat 800, and there are times when they come close. Uh, Juice Johnson was one of the groundskeepers for a lot of years, and he'd go down spring training for the Twins. And instead of going to the games, he would go out in the field and hang out with the other groundskeepers, the pros, and he'd ask them, what are you doing here? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And he'd take that information and bring it back. And as you can see from the field, I mean, just look at the edging, the hours, the time to do that just perfect. It's really unheard of especially considering it's all volunteer work. 
So that's Mies Hill. Uh, the next slide is the cover ballpark, New Ulm. You can see welcome sign in New Ulm just over the pitcher's shoulder. Uh, New Ulm is one of those WPA projects built in the 30s, Johnson Park, uh, great history, uh, especially considering who played there for one season, just one season. He was so good, he kept moving up. But in one season, Terry Steinbach played uh, town ball in 1983. And that particular team was so good that year, it had four players drafted by the pros, four players on one amateur baseball team. It was Terry Steinbach, his brother Tom, a guy named Doug Palmer, and Jeff Schlugel. All four of them drafted. And then you go back into the 50s. In 1953, 31,000 fans attended the state tournament. Attendance on the final day was 7,700, the highest ever. And if you look out in center field right now, that fence is at set at about 430 feet. Back in the day, it was set at 440 feet. And if you hit a ball, outfielders knew that they had plenty of room to go back and get it. One guy named Jim Stull for Arlington hit the flagpole and kept running. And he was a big guy and he pooped out at third base and he stopped and his coach was screaming, what are you waiting for? And he said, a guy hits a ball that far, you ought to be able to take a break. The next slide is Cannon Falls. Cannon Falls is a, a beautiful old ballpark, kind of an odd shaped ballpark, again, tucked in along the Cannon River. So left field is very shallow and they have about a 20 foot fence out there to catch a lot of the balls. Otherwise they pop up routine fly balls would be over the fence. Um, it's one of the rare places where the best seat in the house is standing in line at the concession stand and it was uh, named after John Birch. Uh, and he literally hit the ball so hard once uh, it fell apart. And there is a big article about it that the Cannon Falls bearers show, shared with me uh, about his uh, uh, slug that uh, basically knocked the skin off the baseball. The next shot is of Delano. Delano is one of those fields I didn't get a lot of input about, but once I got there, I said, man, it fits everything. Look at that ivy covered fence. Look at dad with his son. I mean, if that isn't a Norman Rockwell photograph, I don't know what is. It's an absolute gorgeous ballpark. And uh, it's kind of considered Twin City. Delano's that not that far out. So they get a lot of state tournaments as well. It's a beautiful ballpark. The next slide is of Gaylord. Gaylord is out in that uh, western, uh, southwestern area near Arlington. And um, there's a guy named Bill Walsh. And Bill Walsh, that's the field is named after him. And when I started this project in uh, 2014 or so, I went out on scouting missions. And this particular day, it was a March day. The wind was biting. It would have just snowed the day before. It was freezing cold. And I go out to this field and I get out of the car and, I, and my eyes are watering. It's colder than heck. And I go, what am I doing? What am I doing? This is crazy. This is, and I thought I was crazy. I could see a lone person way out on the warning track chipping away at ice. He saw me, he came over and he introduced himself as Bill Walsh. I kind of did a double take. I looked at him. I looked at the scoreboard that said Bill Walsh Field. And I said, are you the Bill Walsh? And the old gent looked at me and smiled and said, yep. And I didn't even have to die. And I got my name on the scoreboard. Uh, Gaylord is a beautiful ballpark. Absolutely gorgeous. And highly recommend visiting it to anybody who's in that area. The next slide is of Jordan. Meesville is it. Meesville is, is a great ballpark, ranked tops by most. I would give Jordan the nod over Meesville for a bunch of reasons. One, as you can see to the far right, those are those oil derrick lights that I've been talking about, but that particular light juts out into the field. And there's two or three of them like that, um, which makes balls bouncing off that particular side of the fence. Very interesting. Uh, Jordan is also 
the home of uh, a former Minneapolis Laker basketball player named Jim Pollard. In the 1950s, he would play ball for the Jordan Brewers and probably made as much, if not more, playing ball than he did playing basketball. And he hit a ball that they say didn't stop until it got to Chicago, and they describe it as a, a mammoth blast that cleared the left field fence, cleared the left field road, and landed in a rail car of a freight train heading east. The other thing I like about Jordan is if you look way out there, they have a manual scoreboard, and that's a thing of the past for the most part these days. They have a guy out there, it might be a kid, might be an older guy, um, and they've got numbers and they run up and down at, at uh, in between innings to keep the score updated. Um, and right where it says balls and strikes, they use old traffic semaphores that they turn horizontal and uh, they use those for ball strike markers, indicators. It's a great town. It's a beautiful ballpark. Calvin Griffin called it the mini Met. I don't, I'm not sure what that meant, but it is by far a go-to uh, ballpark for any of you looking at these fields and wanting to visit them. The next slide is such a wonderful photo. It's so typical dusk in Minnesota. This is Wasika. Um, and some of you may remember three or four years ago, the Wasika ballpark was burned to the ground by an arsonist. Um, it was another WPA project built in the late 30s. It was a beautiful rickety old ballpark. I love those old grandstands. And it was reduced to rubble. And uh, Tink Larson, the namesake of the field, was devastated. He lives right literally 200 feet from third base um, and would be over there. It's his whole life. And he was devastated, as was the entire town. And they got together and they raised enough money, I think it was over $2 million, and rebuilt the park. So they still have baseball in Wasika, but it's a beautiful, beautiful ballpark. In fact, Tink's thought so much of it that his uh, dog, named Harmon is buried behind home plate. The other Tink story quickly is that back in the days of the Met Stadium when it was sitting vacant and they were trying to decide to, what to do with the land, uh, Tink knew a guy who knew a guy who had a key to Met Stadium. So one day instead of practicing, he got the team together and said, come we're gonna take a little field trip. And he brought a flatbed truck with him he told every kid to bring a ratchet set. They got to the ballpark. There was a guy there in the shadows who opened the door for him. They backed the truck in. He said, okay, go to it. And they started disassembling as many seats as they could. And I think they got about 200, 250 seats, threw them on the truck, covered them up, and got the heck out of town. And when I asked Tink, did anybody say you could do it? He looked at me and winked and said, well, no one really said I couldn't. So that's... Unfortunately, most of those seats melted in the fire, so they're no longer there. Pearl Lake. Next slide, please. Pearl Lake is one of those little ballparks you drive by and you just go, well, that's kind of cute. It's not anything super great, but there's something missing. There was something different. and You can probably tell from this photo what it is. There's no outfield fence. Uh, the field is formed by two county roads that intersect in a 90 degree corner at deep center field, which is well deep into the 400 foot range, maybe even pushing 500 feet. Um, the left field and right field corners are just over 300 feet. And as you can see, see by this Pearl Lake Laker, he's leaping up to get the ball and he's just negotiated about a six foot berm that goes from the field up to this road. And if you don't plant your feet right, you end up on your rear end, which a lot of new players end up doing when they play at Pearl Lake. Uh, the ground rule stipulates that if that ball hits the gravel, it's a double, and if it pings off the asphalt, it's a home run. They've never been to a state tournament, and they have more players than they know what to do with every year. They're there for fun. And I should say also that particular conference 
one of the stipulations is that the uh, loser buys the winner a case of beer at the end of the game. So that might have something to do with it too. Um, Loretto, next slide, is uh, a beautiful ballpark out by Medina. Uh, Loretto Larks are the team. Uh, this is the Cook family. At one point, everybody in the family was either playing or working the concession stand. Herb is the patriarch to the far left, his wife Shelly in front of him, their daughter Haley. And number seven is Kent. And he actually ran for the mayor of Loretto back when he was a St. Cloud State student and baseball player, and he won. And that was probably, I think, about eight years ago. And to my knowledge, Kent is still mayor there um, and still plays ball. And it's just a great, great story about family. And that's really what this book is about. A lot of family and a lot of traditional uh, traditions. Belle Plain. Belle Plain, here's a play at the play. Belle Plain's a beautiful old ballpark. And when I say old, they hold something dear that uh, not a lot of ballparks can claim. And that is they're in the same exact spot that the Red Caps played on in 1884, 136 years ago. It's a beautiful ballpark. It's south of Jordan, and it's not far from Union Hill. You can make it a picnic day and see three or four of these ballparks and be very impressed. The next field is Midway. <clears throat> when I called uh, the county, if you could change the slide, please, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the Midway team. And Midway is a ghost town, basically. It's a population five. Uh, the town was merged into the mu much larger metropolis of Wolf Lake, population 57. So uh, when I called the county to ask about Midway, I heard the lady put the phone down and said, does anybody know where Midway is? Is that in our county or what? Gives you a pretty good sign that it's a small place, and it is. But they've been playing baseball for over 60 years, and in 2010, believe it or not, won the state tournament, the smallest team ever to do so. Um, they're an amazing team. I have a fantastic story about one of their alumni, a gentleman by the name of Randy Berkman. Um, Randy was a heck of a player. He was a gangly kid. There wasn't much to him, but he could throw a curveball like nobody's business. And he made it. He was drafted by the New York Mets, and he's working his way up the different classes, and he was a second class up when he was involved in a snowmobile accident where a friend ran over him at 70 miles an hour and uh, snapped his tibia and fibula. They were set incorrectly and his legs had to be broken and reset again. Now, if you think that's not bad enough to an aspiring baseball player, that was in the winter, spring. In the fall, he goes out on a deer hunt and a kid who is a rookie hunter shoots at a deer, misses the deer and hits Randy, right in the femur of the same leg. Uh, he's in rough shape. He didn't bleed out. It was all a miracle, but he was very depressed. Thought of really kind of ending it all because he couldn't do what he wanted to do. He'd never be a pro baseball player. But his sister got together with him and said, you can still throw. You still got an arm. And he took that to heart, cleaned up, and pitched for the snare birds for another 10 years or so. And he averaged about 10 strikeouts a game on a left foot two inches shorter than the right foot. It's an incredible story, one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard of anybody. And Randy is probably in his early 60s now, and I met him five years ago or so at a, at a tournament, and he had given up baseball just a year or two before that, but he was so uptight, ready for his team to hit the, hit the field. I, he was pacing, I said, Randy, you're not playing anymore. And he looks at me and goes, it still doesn't leave you. It's just always there, the competition. Um, so let's talk about some of the characters that played this ball. The original Iron Man uh, is a guy named Joe Driscoll. He's from the town of Arlington, or played with Arlington, which is our next slide. Arlington's a beautiful park. They have a long history of state championships. 
Uh, Driscoll was quite a character. He played in over 1,200 games, 1,200 games in 100 ballparks over 45 years. Uh, it's just unheard of. The other guy was Jim Stoll. I mentioned him earlier. He's the guy that planted the ball off the field, uh, the flagpole in Arlington. Uh, he played originally up in Marble, which is a town on the Iron Range. And when he would hit a home run, if it hit a window of a car and it shattered, the person that owned that car wouldn't get it fixed. He'd drive around town with pride saying, look at how far Stoll hit this one. Jim was a character. He's still with us. He lives out in the West Coast. And he actually played uh, minor league ball at one point with Willie Stargell of Pittsburgh and became friends with him. The next slide shows Cold Spring. Cold Spring is, again, just one of those classic, well, uh, very up-to-date ballpark, fresh paint on everything. Everything's meticulous. Everything is groomed perfectly. Uh, Ivy covered fence. In fact, well, I was there 25 years ago with my family, and we went to a night game, and everybody checked us out because we were the newbies coming in, wondering who we were. But we sat there and enjoyed it. And I remember the old fence that the old scoreboard out of the fence they had. One kid was hanging numbers and the other kid was hanging upside down. And uh, it was uh, obvious that uh, the one kid could have cared less about baseball and the one other kid could. But it was so funny to see. And it was just so small townish. I just never forgot it. I thought it was really cool. Um, they moved to this location in 1923, but work stopped when a Catholic priest discovered there once was a graveyard in left field. So he said, that's it, stop the digging over there. So as a result, left field was two, foot high, two feet higher than home plate. Today, there's over 400 players ages five to 18 in the program in Cold Spring, especially impressive considering Cold Spring's just a town of 4,000. So their future as a baseball entity continues. Union Hill, Union Hill is a, next slide please. Union Hill is one of those, um, well, we'll back up one, I'm sorry. Thanks Matt, appreciate it. Union Hill is a beautiful ballpark. It's on the uh, border of Scott and Dakota County. Uh, halfway between New Prague and um, Belle Plaine. And it's a gorgeous ballpark. Uh, one team from California, an over 35 league team, was in Minnesota playing. And one of the fields they played at was Union Hill. And they were so impressed with the field that they wanted to uh, buy it. I'm going to show this. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it all. This is the book. I'm going to show you here, if you can see that. You look at that outfield. There's not an outfield like that in the state. And it's all based on property lines and what they could use and what they couldn't. Really, the, uh, the patriarch of this team, Don Geeson, lives on a farm right along the left field. And uh, he bought it specifically so they could move the field fence back. <laughs> Only done. Okay. Looks. Bear with me here just a minute. I'm just. Oh, there we go. Red Wing is the next slide. Red Wing is a beautiful ballpark tucked in the bluffs of the Mississippi River. Um, they always have a great team and they have uh, many state tournaments and host a lot of tournaments. And they, their big uh, feud is with Mies Hill just down the road and the two of them are constantly going at it against each other. It's a stunningly beautiful ballpark, uh, kind of tricky to find. You're always going to need directions or GPS to get there. Uh, but there's a story that goes back, um, back in this, probably the 70s. Uh, the Red Wing president of baseball invited Kelvin Griffith to come down and his brother, Sherry Robertson, to watch 
a charity baseball game they were doing. And there was a player named Jay Bombeck, and he was a heck of a player, and he was hitting line drive after line drive, just smoking the ball. And after one particularly crushing shot to the fence, Kelvin leaned over to the president, Dave Oden, of the uh, Red Wing of Society and said, you know, we ought to hire this guy. We ought to sign this guy. <laughs> and Dave looked at him and he says, Cal, for crying out loud, you already signed him and you already released him. Uh, uh, Jay played in the 1973 season with the Geneva New York Twins. But the, the, that's just one of many Kelvin stories that, that pop up in amateur baseball. Finally, we have the team from Red Eye. Red Eye Township is literally at the end of the road. I think it's probably the most uh, isolated ballpark in the entire state. Um, it's neat in that if you were there 50 years earlier, nothing would have changed. They have an outhouse, uh, which is vented by shotgun shell holes. Their concession stand is a hand pump where you can get water. Um, shortstops don't dive for the ball much because there's so many rocks in the infield that they get scraped up too much. And the sign welcoming you to Red Eye Field is for a men's clothing store that closed over 25 years ago. But I kept them in the book, even though they might be closing up shop because of their 60 year uh, history of playing baseball and good baseball too. So what's in a chapter? We talk about the team, as you know, we talked about the ballpark and we talk about the town. Um, every town is an integral part of the team. There's just no doubt about it. And just a few little neat tidbits about the town. And if you're into towns, if you're into history at all, you're gonna love this. Uh, there's so much to chat about, but we'll start with Cannon Falls. In the cemetery there, you'll see a huge statue of Colonel William Colville. He's Minnesota's greatest Civil War hero. He led a charge of 260 men against 1,600 rebel troops at Seminary Ridge at Gettysburg. And the charge saved the Union line from being penetrated, but it also resulted in the highest casualty rate of any unit in the history of the U.S. military. You go to Dassel, they have a weird museum dedicated to ergot. Ergot is a fungus that comes off the wheat and rye plants. It's incredibly toxic if you ingest it, but if you use it uh, outside the body, it's, it's got really miracle drug. It's a miracle drug for hemorrhaging, things like that. And you might've seen old World War II movies where they rip open a packet and dump it on a wound of a soldier, that's ergot. Ergot was made by Eli Lilly and mostly was gotten from Europe and during the Spanish-American War and the outbreak of the Second World War, those avenues were closed up. And a guy from Dassel went out to all the farmers out west, Montana, uh, Alberta, uh, Manitoba, and said, don't throw this stuff away. It looks, looks like black kernels. And he said, don't throw this stuff away, ship it to us. And they did. And they used that. It's one of nature's most contradictory organisms because it can save lives, but it can also uh, drive people into concussions, in uh, seizures, and all kinds of crazy stuff. In fact, they think the Salem witch hunt, the women that were talking in tongues and acting weird were probably poisoned by ergot. They had a wet uh, summer that year, and the summer and the wetness uh, created fungus on the wheat plants, and that's probably what caused them to go goofy. Cold Spring, there is a chapel in the hills. And it's from 1877, there was a grasshopper plague in Stearns County. It was so bad that the townspeople got together and prayed to the Virgin Mary and basically said, please save us from the grasshoppers. Three weeks after the chapel was built, the plague stopped. The locals considered a miracle. The uh, original chapel was blown down by a tornado, except for the statue of Virgin Mary stayed up. They rebuilt the chapel, and to this day, you can go up there and look, and uh, as you walk in the door, there are two grasshoppers bowing in deference to the Virgin Mary, 
and that was in in, in fact uh, every August they held a mass there uh, in remembrance of the fact that the grasshopper plague came and this chapel they think probably saved them from ruin. Belle Plain. There's a house there. It's a two-story house and it looks pretty normal from the front but when you go to the back you see this weird thing where there's walkways from the second floor over to this wing and basically it's a two-story outhouse. You know you figure out the, the phys physics of that but I can tell you it's pretty fascinating. Uh, one media company came in and was doing a what what about story and they nicknamed this the sky crapper um red wing by the way is home of the world's largest boot size 638 and a half weighs two twenty three hundred pounds and that's courtesy of course of red wing shoes and then you get to rochester and you find out that the real founders of the mayo clinic weren't the Mayo brothers, it was the Franciscan nuns that were there. And they put everything on the line and actually gave the down payment for the hospital to the doctors who then said, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna make the best hospital money can buy. I also found out that Moonlight Graham, if you remember Field of Dreams, Burt Lancaster, who played Moonlight Graham, uh, is buried at uh, Calvary Cemetery, about a mile away from Mayo Field, one of the featured fields in my book. And when you go there, there are actual baseballs left by people relatively recently that says, thank you, Moonlight, for your devotion and your uh, service to your city. As you recall, he gave up becoming a pro player to become a doctor, and he was the city doctor for the town of Eveleth for many, many decades. I also have a section uh, with the best nicknames, and I won't do all of them, but I can give you some of them. I, I also mentioned Midway Snared Birds. That gets number one prize. Uh, the Huntersville Horseflies, the Red Eye Country Boys. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the others. Uh, the Howard Lake Orphans, that's a doozy. Um, we had a lot of fun with that. We had a group to get together, and after a few beers and pizza, we came up with our, our top names. Um, so what did I learn through this whole process? I learned that I was really surprised no one had published a book uh, that showcases these ballparks. Um, you know, if you look at it, I'd be the last person to write a book on amateur baseball. I played baseball to Little League, that's it. Um, I liked baseball. I didn't know anything about town ball. But I think sometimes it takes somebody from the outside looking in to really peel that cover away and show people what it is that has so many people from rural Minnesota so excited and such a big part of their lives. I realized these baseball parks were more than just rake dirt, manicured grass. It was really about the passion and care of groundskeepers who have quietly labored for decades on these ballparks, purely out of one reason, for the love of the game. It was many times emotional too, uh, is when I interviewed an 83 year old farmer in Meesville who sets up live national anthem speakers. And by the way, they have a one year waiting list of people wanting to come down there to sing. He does it at every home game. And in his voice choked with emotion, he says the singing of the anthem is really the most important part of the game was also emotional as many thanked me, some of them with tears in their eyes for telling the story of a sport that was a huge part of the lives of them, their father, their brother, their uncle. Um, it, it, was, it was really very touching. I was at a game in Gaylord and a guy came up to me and asked, what was my favorite ballpark? And I said, wherever I am right now, because every ballpark was special. And when I was there, it was always that special moment at that ballpark. Um, in closing this presentation, I'd like to just quote a couple of paragraphs from the Fairfax uh, ballpark story. And it reads like this. In its 68 years, Memorial Park in Fairfax has played host to three generations of boys 
dreaming for the chance to roam its grass one day, just like their dads, brothers, relatives, and neighborhood buddies. For 30 of those years, next slide please, Shavy Prax has clipped grass, pulled weeds, and edged the infield with the greatest of care. The ballpark and its caretaker have been a constant in a world of change, as reassuring as a summer breeze through a Renville County prairie. Former Fairfax newspaper editor Steve Palmer summed it up best when he said, as a kid, when I saw those lights shining down on the ballpark, I knew everything was okay with the world. So that is my presentation. Uh, again, the book is called Town Ball Parks in Minnesota. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you where to publish it. That's not, uh, uh, the book is out of print. Um, we printed 5,000 books and sold 5,000 books as of about a year ago. But I think Matt said there's four or five copies in the Dakota County Library System. And you could certainly go there if you so desire. Yeah, to, to go off of what Todd just mentioned there, um, the T Dakota County Library System, I, I believe Hennepin, Ramsey County also have it. Um, if your library, um, you know, most libraries participate in interlibrary loans. So um, you should be able to get your hands on the book. I, I know there was one library and I don't remember where it was, Todd, that we were looking and um, they were actually all uh, checked out. So the, they have them, you just might have to be on a wait list for a little while. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I want to thank Todd for the presentation. Um, you know, looking at these pictures growing up playing baseball, it's always great to, to see these pictures. And um, so some of the people that are on here may or may not be aware. And actually, some people on here are part of it. Um, but we have um, a vintage baseball program within Minnesota. And uh, Todd was mentioning Nininger and the Dakota County Historical Society. We actually have one of those vintage baseball teams that play by the rules of 1860. And uh, some of the, the community Todd was mentioning, um, you know, Rochester, uh, Wazika doesn't have a team, but we've played there in the past. Um, I highly encourage you to look out and uh, one attend and go to see some of these baseball games when they happen again. Um, but then also uh, look for other areas and, and ways to learn and, and enjoy baseball, whether it's, you know, the Little League or the, the town ball programs at um, these stadiums that Todd was mentioning here, or even those vintage baseball games. Um, so with that, if there's any questions, I know there are a couple of comments that came in, so I'll address those while um, some people may or may not ask some questions here. Um, so there was uh, the home run landing in the rail car. There was a comment that uh, that was actually part of a movie, uh, the final scene, the home run landing in a rail car in Iowa heading for Chicago. Um, so that really? was comments that was based off wow. of what you had presented. Wow. Um, the, uh, I, I don't know if it was Pearl Lake, the uh, area that has the outfield with that's bordered by the roads. Yes. Someone commented that if you walk into the outfield, it's sunk down a couple of feet. So you're actually looking down on some of the outfielders out there. Um, That's true. In fact, there's about a six foot berm all the way around that you have to climb as an outfielder. And if you don't climb it right, you end up on your backside real fast. And I guess when visiting team comes, comes visiting teams come in, it happens quite frequently. And the guys from Pro Lake get a lot of yucks out of that watching the guy down and he's half embarrassed but everybody's laughing it off it's good good times oh man i'm sorry that was that comment was actually meant for wasika but uh okay um, and uh, someone else mentioned the the comment on uh moonlight graham um they had traveled up to chisholm and went through their museum and they had a section about moonlight graham and uh this connection to rochester so what I thought was so neat, Matt, was uh, the, the baseballs left behind by people thanking him for his service to his community. And they were relatively recent. It wasn't, you know, because you could read them on the, the messages were written on baseballs and left at his grave. So that was pretty touching. Yeah, excellent. Well, uh, again, we, we want to thank Todd for uh, taking the time to come out and, and join us for this presentation and thank each of you that registered for it. We also want to thank the Union Pacific Foundation um, for the sponsorship of our virtual programs uh, since COVID. 
we uh, actually received a Union Pacific Foundation grant, uh, COVID relief grant that has allowed us to put on more than uh, 650 registrations for our 30 plus events we've held. So it's, it's been pretty successful and um, without that grant, we wouldn't be able to do some of these programs and um, without presenters like Todd, uh, we wouldn't be able to do them either. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending out a follow-up email at the end within the next couple of days. Um, we will uh, have a survey in there, we'll just ask you to take some time uh, it's about 10 questions, should only take you a couple minutes to go through. Let us know how the presentation went, uh, ideas, suggestions for future presentations. I know coming up in December, we have a history of Minnesota hockey during the 1920s. So that, that should be a fascinating presentation as well. Um, and then we'll also include that link once the um, video is up on our YouTube channel. So with that, I will thank you one last time, Todd and uh, everyone for coming out and viewing this presentation. And uh, we hope you all have a safe and uh, happy evening. Thanks, Thanks man.